Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar, part of the Marine Protected Area Center webinar series, sponsored by NOAA's National Marine Protected Area Center and OCTO. I'm Zach Canizzo with NOAA's National Marine Protected Area Center, and I'll be your moderator today. We're very excited for today's webinar, titled Mud Matters, Understanding the Role of Ocean Sediments in Storing Carbon, presented by Sarah Hutter, Hutto and Dr. Doug George. Zach, we lost you. Zach, can you hear us? Zach! <laughs> okay. Um, let me, let's see. Okay, well, um, we've lost Zach's audio. Um, I don't have your bios handy, Sarah and Doug. That is okay. Um, Zach, I guess he can't hear us either. Let me wave at him. No. Zach! no. Oh, he sees me. <laughs> All right, wait, let's send him, I'll send him a chat. Yeah. Sorry, guys. Um, on it. Let's give him a second. And if, uh, if he can't get his audio back, then I can just start. It's fine. Okay. Oh, no. Can you? Okay, so I think Zach's going to come back in. And um, we're getting feedback too from, I'm going to presume it's from you, Doug. Because um, I think it's, it's um, I'm going to. There we go. That's better. Back. Yeah, I All think right, you Sarah. Were. Sarah, if you want to go ahead and get started, um, I'll just let people know that you can go ahead and ask questions. You can put them into the question panel throughout the webinar, and we'll have dedicated time for questions at the end. Okay. Can you hear me now? Over you, Sarah. Oh, there oh, yeah, he is. Can. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Apologies, everyone. We spent like 15 minutes before the webinar talking, and there were no problems. So that's very odd. Um, do I should I, do I need to start from the top? Could you all hear me at all? We heard like the first mm, paragraph. Okay, I'll go ahead and start with introducing uh, Sarah. So Sarah Hutto is the Conservation and Climate Program Coordinator for Greater Fer for the Greater Farallons Association in support of NOAA's Greater Farallons and Cordell Bank National Marine Sanctuaries. Sarah's work focuses on integrating climate change planning into marine protected areas management, which spans a diversity of subject matters from marine sediments to our largest ocean inhabitants, the great whales. Sarah's background is in rocky intertidal and kelp forest ecology from Moss Landing Marine Laboratories, and she is based out of Santa Cruz, California. Dr. Doug George is a geological oceanographer at NOAA's Office for Coastal Management in the Applied Science Division and the Program Manager for the National Estuary Research Reserve System Science Collaborative. Over the last two decades, he has worked on estuary restoration, living shorelines, regional sediment management, and climate change adaptation. Dr. George's background includes a BS in oceanography from Humboldt State University, an MS in journalism from Columbia University, an MS in oceanography from Dalhousie University, and a PhD in hydrologic sciences from the University of California, Davis. We're very excited to have Sarah and Doug here today. Here today, but before we turn it over to them, I would like to let you know that we encourage you to ask questions throughout the presentation as they occur to you. Please type your questions in the question box, which is found at the bottom of your control panel, which often pops up on the right-hand side of your screen, and we'll pose the questions to the panelists at the end of the presentation. With that, I'll turn things over to Sarah. Thank you, Zach, and good morning, everyone. Um, Doug and I are very excited to be here with you. Um, before I get started, I just want to recognize our colleague, Sage T. Zach, also with Greater Fairlands Association in support of the sanctuaries. Um, her, her genius at geostatistical analysis um, will be showed in this presentation with her beautiful maps, and so we're, we're very grateful for her contribution to this um, important work. So I thought I would set the, the context for um, our study um, here, just the first few minutes. Uh, the study area is in California. And it's essentially the boundaries of Greater Fairlands and Cordell Bank National Marine Sanctuaries, um, which includes the northern portion of Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary. 
And so you can see the map of those uh, three sanctuaries and um, kind of towards the bottom right is the, the peninsula with San Francisco to kind of orient you to where we are in California. Um, the, the study area ranges from Point Arena in the north down to Point Ana Nuevo in the south and covers about 5,500 square miles. This area was designated and is, is kind of a critically important area, um, primarily because it's characterized by cool, nutrient-rich upwelled water that supports a great diversity of, of organisms. And we conducted this work out of the ONMS Office of National Marine Sanctuaries Center for Collaboration on Ocean Climate Change, which is um, stationed at our office in Chrissy Field in San Francisco. Now these sanctuaries are part of the US national system of uh, national marine sanctuaries. And here's a map of, of all of those sanctuaries in the US. And we have a few coming online to join the system. Um, and this is really a, a system of federal marine protected areas that are designated to um, protect areas that have great ecological or, or cultural value. Now this project, our Blue Carbon in Marine Protected Areas project, we kicked off about four years ago in 2020. We recognized that there was a need for us to better understand at, at our sanctuary um, what sort of blue carbon sequestration processes were occurring and if we were doing um, enough of a good job of protecting those carbon stores and sequestration processes. So it was initially, um, a learning process for us. So our primary goal ultimately is to increase the protection and restoration of blue carbon in MPAs broadly, but also specifically in our sanctuary. But then also, you know, as we learned more about this subject area and um, being the, the climate coordinator for the sanctuary, we also realized that there was a really important need to demonstrate the role of MPAs in helping to reach global and, and national climate mitigation goals. And so we really want to use this project and the results of this project um, to, to continue to educate and raise awareness around the importance of the ocean in climate mitigation, and in particular, the importance of protected ocean places in climate mitigation. Um, shortly after we launched, the, launched this project in 2021, we published this two-part, what was initially a two-part series, addressing um, exactly what I was just describing um, of trying to elevate MPAs as part of the climate solution by better understanding and characterizing blue carbon. So part one is really a literature review. It was kind of the product of us doing all of this learning. And our primary audience is MPA managers. We wanted one place where a manager of a protected area um, could go to better understand all the different processes that are likely contributing to carbon sequestration. We also have guiding principles and specifically a path forward for the Office of National Marine Sanctuaries. And then part two was really fun. It's where we uh, actually attempted to quantify the role of Kind of a subset of these carbon sequestration processes within the Greater Farallon Sanctuary. Um, and if you're interested to learn more about any of that, we have a great story map that my colleague Sage Tezak uh, put together. And it's a little more interactive um, to better understand some of these carbon sequestration processes and the results of our part two assessment, uh, which was really, really informative for us. However, during that assessment and kind of all of our learning, we kept coming back to the fact that, yes, we have some coastal fringing um, blue carbon habitats that are typically the focus of most of this work, like seagrasses and salt marsh, but the vast majority of our sanctuary is open ocean and seafloor. And so we really wanted to better understand how much carbon is stored in our seafloor, in the sanctuary's marine sediments. And then what sorts of activities could be disturbing that sediment carbon? The reason that we felt this was um, kind of the most critical next step for us to better understand and characterize blue carbon is because it's pretty 
clear in the literature that marine sediments are a really significant carbon sink. I like to think of the ocean seafloor as the final resting place of much of the planet's organic carbon. And in fact, marine sediments are the world's largest non-fossil pool of organic carbon. Continental shelves are typically organic carbon hotspots, particularly in places where you have coastal upwelling, which we do have very significant upwelling along our coast. That's just because we're, we're have really highly productive waters. And so you have uh, much more primary production that can result in carbon sequestration naturally. And then also continental shells are organic carbon hotspots because of terrestrial input. And I think this satellite image really shows when we have um, you know, these heavy winter rains, how much carbon laden sediment ends up being washed into the ocean. Um, and so it was pretty clear to us that our region probably had a lot of carbon in the sediment because of these, of these factors. The literature is also um, really building and growing around the impact of disturbance to the seafloor. And we do know that seafloor disturbance can remineralize carbon that is bonded, kind of tied up in these um, small grain sediments it can kind of disturb that bond and remineralize that carbon into aqueous CO2, which can exacerbate ocean acidification, can eventually make it back into surface waters where there could be some exchange with the atmosphere. Um, the literature is certainly growing to kind of make those connections less tenuous, but it is clear that seafloor disturbance can impact that sediment carbon in some way. And then the final thing that was really striking to us is that globally, marine sediment carbon is not adequately protected. Only about 4% of um, seafloor sediments are within some sort of marine protected area, but only 2% are protected from activities that can disturb the, the seafloor. And that, that figure came out of um, Atwood's 2020 study. The final note that I'll make, and this really ties together with our part two assessment, is that a lot of the carbon that we find in our seafloor sediments comes from marine life. Um, it comes from kelp on our coastline. It can come from kelp that's dislodged, makes it out to the open ocean and sinks to the seafloor. It can come from, you know, phytoplankton and zooplankton and feces of marine animals that kind of drift down as marine snow. That carbon can come from large, large animals like whales that sink when they die. And that carbon gets incorporated into the sediments. But carbon can also come from terrigenous inputs. And here's just a couple more images to really show the significance of river discharge and how much carbon is pouring into our marine sanctuary when that occurs. So um, to get to this study, with all of this information in mind, we really felt that in order to support the informed management of the seafloor, we needed to increase our understanding of marine sediment carbon. We wanted to know how much carbon is in our sanctuary sediments. Are there particular areas that have more carbon than others? So can we identify carbon hotspots? And then what sorts of activities could be disturbing the seafloor? And do those activities occur in any sort of hotspots we might be able to identify? So now I'm gonna turn it over to Doug and he'll take us through not only the, the, the results of this study, but he'll also give us a little more geophysical setting um, and then I will come back on later to kind of discuss the implications of, of this work. Can't hear you yet, Doug. No, we can't hear you okay. yet. Okay. Oh, there you are. Okay. Yes. Okay, we have all kinds of audio issues. Apologies to everybody all over the world. <laughs> we had this figured out yesterday. Um, so yeah, thanks Sarah, and thanks for um, thanks Octo for for giving us this uh, the space to give this presentation. Um, so picking up where Sarah was left off. Um, so a couple of things about the the physics of of the region of our study area, just to kind of get into the details about why some of the sediment is where it is, which then leads to understanding where the carbon hotspots might be. So on the, the, the three maps you're seeing on your screen right now, we're looking at wave orbital velocity. So that's 
how the waves uh, at, at the seafloor, the velocities that are churning up the seafloor um, and the sediment. And then the other two are how uh, El Nino Southern Oscillation phase phases, so either La Nina or El Nino, can mobilize different parts of the seafloor. And these are from study um, from study at the USGS. And I just want to point out, like the with the waveboard of velocities, the red areas are where the velocities are the fastest. So we would expect those to be close to shore, uh, where it's it's shallower and the waves are breaking. But we still see out in the Gulf of the Farallons, which I don't know if, if uh, we can move the pointer around, um, but where there's still there's still significant um, disturbance of the seafloor. So that gives us an indication of where fine sediment is being stripped away. Uh, if you looked at the other two slides, the ones lettered A and B, or maps, I mean, the mobilization of the seafloor, the, the hotter colors, the orange, the yellows, oranges, and reds, are where more of the seafloor is being disturbed, um, at least 5% of the time during a, in either El Nino or La Nina event uh, season. And so again, this is giving us indications of where the finer sediment, which we're gonna talk about in a moment, why we're concerned about the mud more than the sand, where the sand is being exposed and where the mud is being removed. So we can go to the next slide. And keeping those sort of that disturbance pattern um, in your mind, this slide is looking at, this is from a study in, uh, from Edwards in 2002. And this is showing on the maps the amount of percent sand, which is the first one, um, letter A, silt, B, and clay, C. So we can merge in your mind silt and clay into mud. And what we're looking at here, are the, the darker colors are higher concentrations. So the 100% sand is close to shore, but then the 100% mud is in the mid, mid shelf. And this really helps explain where we might find carbon hotspots um, because carbon and mud bind together. I'll show a slide about that in a moment. But just again, orienting you all to the, the geography and the geophysics of this region. So we get these patterns of sand, mud, sand, and that depends on that wave, that wave energy. It depends on the fluvial input, so what's coming from the rivers, how close they are to, um, to a deposition area. So further north from this study, where Sarah had some of those satellite images, showing the big pulses, the big plumes coming out from the, sea, from the Russian River, uh, the mud depth centers are closer into shore because there's just more mud coming into the system. And so this has implications for what's going to be a hard or soft or hard substrate um, as we move from the coast out to the deeper ocean. Next slide. So I mentioned now twice that grain size and, and carbon have some kind of connection. And what this graphic is showing is that the course of the grain size, so the top ones there, the, the gravels, uh, do not contain much organic carbon. And as we go finer down, that, down the, the, the pictures of the grain sizes to the muddier areas, to the muddier components, you get higher and higher concentrations of mud. This is because smaller grain sizes have a larger surface area to volume ratio. This is why when we talk about contaminants like DDT or PCBs or heavy metals, um, all of these have more places to bind on muds compared to sands or gravels. So muds transport all of the, I'll say nutrients and contaminants because it can, they, they move good things too, but they also move bad things. Um, in this case, organic carbon is neither good nor bad. It is just part of the system. But this is why when we're thinking about where are we going to find organic carbon hotspots, we're, we want to look for where there's muddier areas, more likely than sandier areas. There's also some geochemical reactions going on um, that when the muds compact, we're squeezing out um, the oxygen, the oxygenated water. And when we start to go, then that starts a process of geochemistry reactions that lock that carbon in place. And when it gets disturbed, that, th that those cycles get, um, get disrupted. And that carbon that was previously locked up because of the chemistry and the chemical reactions, the anoxic, you know, there's no oxygen there, all of that changes again. So as Sarah mentioned a few slides ago, 
resuspension in, into, into aqueous carbon um, will have an impact on the overall chemistry of the ocean too. Uh, next slide. So what we did is we, t we relied on these concepts behind, behind, the, behind our thinking, and we went out and we found available data in our study area. We found close to 4,600 in discrete samples of, um, that were taken. These span from 1965 to 2022, so a pretty, you know, several decades of, of data collection. Not all of them contained both percent mud and organic carbon, but for the roughly 350 that did, this is what the relationship was. On the axis on the bottom, the x-axis is mud percent, and on the y-axis is organic carbon percent. And as we increase our mud percent, we generally increased our organic carbon percent. It's a tighter relationship on the sandier side, so the zero to 20% side of the, of the scale. And the relationship spreads out more as we move to higher and higher mud contents. But despite this, we still have a very robust relationship. Um, our square root of 0.72, joy to my heart, joy to everyone's heart. Um, and it was a significant, um, significant relationship. We took this relationship, this equation from this very simple line, and then applied it to the remaining 4,200 samples that did not have organic carbon. So once we did that, we now had an estimate for organic carbon across the region. Next slide. Another step before I start showing you some of our results that we needed to take was we wanted to classify the sediment types. It's one thing to say percent mud, percent sand, but describing that uh, helps us understand more about where the carbon is being, um, where it's accumulating, what types of sediment. So what you're looking at here is called ternary plot. And on each one of the three axes of the triangle, we have a percent mud, percent sand, or percent gravel. And as those three percent change for each, for each sample, we're able to put that dot where, where it is. And the, the letters there um, are describing what types of sediment, how we would name that sediment. So um, I'm going to pick on the little s, big M down the lower corner right there, and that's sandy mud. So it's, it has a content, um, it, it's predominantly mud, but it has some sand in it. And so each one of those combinations of letters explains in some specific way how we want to identify that sediment. And this was this was built off of another um, marine sanctuary on the east coast, the Stelbagen Bank um, in Maine. And this was very helpful to find that they had classified and built a version of, a, of, of a, um, an ocean-specific version of the ternary plot. So we could then use this in describing our sediment here on the west coast. Next slide. So here's our five questions and stories. That's just a lot of background, but let's get into what we did with this information once we gathered it. So our five questions, what is the composition on the seafloor, since we didn't have that fully articulated yet? Do those finer sediments contain more organic carbon um, when we lay it out geographically? How much carbon is there in those sanctuary sediments? So what's the carbon stock in this, in this region? Are there hot spots that we can identify? And what might be disturbing the seafloor? And are they near these identified carbon hotspots? So I'm gonna just run through these five answers, or these stories, I should say. So the, most of our samples, I'll start with the map first, so you can ignore the graph for a moment. Um, mo these are our samples, distribution of our samples. So this is 4,600, almost 4,600 points. Um, and these were a combination of cores and grab samples. We, ident we uh, focused on the top 10 centimeters, um, which I'll mention that in a moment again, of, um, of, the sa of the samples if it was a core. If it was a grab, we just used the entire thing. And this distribution is showing, the, the colors are showing the percent mud. So the darker brown ones are high percent, the, the clearer ones are low percent, so you could think of those as sandy, sandier ones. If you look at the graph now, um, the, you can see this play out. Here are the names from that ternary plot I showed a few minutes ago. Here are the names of the different types of sediment. Uh, we had 14 of them that we were identif identified. Most of our samples were sand, but we also had a good number of muddy samples. And 
then it drops off very quickly from gravel and then sort of mixed ones that can't be quite identified as one or the other. So this is just, this is what the seafloor looks like in the sanctuary. When we now start moving into organic carbon, uh, what you're looking at now, the background of the map, and focus your eyes on the map for a moment, um, is blurring across those lines of the sediment types. So all the muds were grouped together in the brown. All the sands are grouped together into that tan color, et cetera. And this is one, one of our first examples of all the great geostatistical work that our colleague Sage did to help understand and visualize the data that we've collected. The dots are indicating the percent organic carbon. So the red dots, I'll start on the bottom of the scale, are the highest content of, of organic carbon dropping down to the zeros with the blue. So you already can maybe start seeing a bit of a pattern here where we have high content of organic carbon. It also is occurring in places where it's muddier. If you look at that box plot um, now, this is kind of expanding on that. And each one of these patterns, if you remember the graph from the previous slide showing the sand and the different muds, so it really plays out that the organic carbon binds more with the mud, which is partly, you know, there's a bit of a circular thing going on here. We rely on that relationship to come up with this relationship or come up with these numbers. But we know from science that this is a reasonable expectation. And it's always good to have that confirmed when we're, when we're dealing with data um, that spans multiple decades. So organic carbon is highest in the muds and then drops off very quickly with the coarser sediment from sand on the way up to gravel. To gravel. Next slide. So this is the only slide with equations. Um, I wanna be clear about that. <laughs> um, and just continuing to visualize from that previous slide that the map is, is pretty similar with the substrates behind, um, behind the dots indicating the percent carbon. Uh, we took these data and using relationships from a lot of different researchers, um, some in the UK who have done uh, a lot of work on this already and established some relationships. We went through and identified the dry bulk density for the different samples. Uh, there's some stuff we can talk about offline if you'd like. Um, and then we just went through this cookbook basically of, of, now of, of equations. We combined the volume, the substrate type, thicknesses, went through all this process and eventually converted the data from percent carbon to carbon mass. And then from carbon mass, we moved on to carbon stock. So we can go to the next slide, which I think reveals our big answers. So the red box, I know I kind of tend to go backwards on some of these, I think as I want to get to the punchline, the, the red box is a summation of all the sediment or all the carbon in the top 10 centimeters of our study area. So almost 9 million metric tons of carbon um, in the top 10 centimeters in this region. The conversions that you can do on the EPA has a number of, of calculators you can use to estimate what is that, how does that translate into something that we can maybe think about more clearly. Um, I don't know how many of you can visualize 3.5 billion gallons of gasoline, but that is what it is. Uh, 3.3 billion gallons of gasoline burned is equivalent to the carbon that's locked up right now on the top 10 centimeters of, the, of our study area. The, in the middle where we have the breakdown of types of sediments, this is just confirming some of what we already have, have, have started to understand, but it also helps elucidate where, the, uh, where that carbon is primarily being stored. In the mud areas, which occupied a smaller area than the sand, they contain the vast majority of the carbon stock. And the different, the sand, the gravels, and the mix, smaller and smaller percentages, um, even though some of the areas, for example, the sand is a much larger area. So this is important when we think about where are protections on, for the seafloor, for seafloor disturbance. Are they in muddy areas or are they in sandy areas? Or, or rockier areas. Uh, next slide. So that gets to our carbon hotspots. And so this was the, the, again, we're just looking at really clear, really clean, simple map of the percent carbon that we found in our different, um, in our different samples. 
So those reds are the high ones, blues are zeros, are very low, and everything in between. So we wanted to fill in the gaps a little bit. You know, I mean, part of geostatistics is, is kind of crossing your fingers sometimes and relying on the relationships that we, um, and the numbers that we can use to, um, to kind of fill space. But you can just see from looking at where the samples are, we have some gaps. We have some areas that we don't have great data. So if we go to the next, yeah, right up in the north, the northwestern part of our study area, and then as we get further offshore um, from the coast, the sample density just decreases. Um, it's farther offshore. It's harder to sample out there. Um, there's not as much motivation sometimes to go further offshore for um, for a number of different reasons. So. Next slide shows when we took the the samples that we did have, and we and and Sage performed her statistical analysis and geostatistical analysis and produced a surface for us. And not surprisingly, um, you know, where we have the highest concentrations as we smear across space is going to be where we have higher concentrations of mud. So the canyon or the, the short parallel mud belt. So if you look at the very southern end of the of the um, of the study area, that is the top end of that previous study that I showed earlier that was talking about the mud belts um, going down the coastline where we had the high percentage of sand and then a high percentage of mud in the middle and then another percentage, higher percentage of sand. That's the very northern tip of that study, which extended further south into Monterey Bay. So there was some confirmation there that we have mud belts there that are also concentrating our organic carbon. As we move up the coast, uh, we have that, that, that short parallel mud belt lit up with the um, organic carbon content. And then offshore, we have these canyons where we have a lot of deposition through turbidity currents that are moving material down to the abyssal plains and concentrating the, uh, the concentrating the, the organic carbon there as well. So the bigger message here is where it's turbulent and where energy decreases, we have fine sediment accumulating. Those fine sediment are carrying the the, the uh, carbon, and so we have these hot spots. Next slide. So the last part of our story is looking at the, the sources of seabed disturbance. And this gets into the management question. So it's a lot of great, you know, fun science, inquisitive science to do, curiosities, a lot of things that we need to go deeper in. This is now when we take that science and we start thinking about the management. And so I'll, I'll read through these four, these four potential sources of, 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 um, of disturbance on the seafloor. Um, certainly when something sinks um, and violates some of our seabed protections, um, they can impact the seafloor, churn up the area. Um, bottom contact fishing, which I'll talk about that in just a minute. Uh, permitted activities, such as things that we know we're going to be doing to the seafloor. Um, and we have a few examples here. Moorings, salvage and recovery, trawling for scientific purposes. And then last, infrastructure in installations. So infrastructure for wind farms, uh, laying fiber optic cables. Um, establishing aquaculture farms, uh, anything that's tying into the seafloor in some fashion or draping along the seafloor is churning up that, that seabed. So what that meant, that, that the map that you're looking at here, and I'm just going to say really briefly, because this is, this is still work in progress. Um, this is just looking at a number of fishing vessels um, over about a 10 year period, nine year period. Um, and so this was like the fishing intensity. In, in some areas based off of um, vessel tracking. And overlaying those with where our organic carbon map. And you can see that the trawlers are not necessarily hitting the organic carbon hotspots as we understand them right now, um, which is good news on, on for everyone's sake. Um, but this is again, a work in progress. It's something that once we have a better handle on many aspects of this question, we'll be able to um, to think a little potentially differently um, or not. That's the thing, the thing. Do we need to do something differently? The answer might be no. Uh, next slide. So um, I think I'm going to hand this back over to 
Sarah um, at this point to kind of zoom back out again. And um, I'll come back on in a minute. Awesome. Thank you so much, Doug. Um, even hearing you present the work we did together is still like exciting to me. I'm like, yeah, we did that. Um, and so clearly we feel like there's, you know, a lot of applications for this information and opportunities for MPA managers when they have access to this type of data. So first, you know, nationally for the, for the U.S., this information can really contribute to a number of the current administration's goals and initiatives that relate to you know, protection and climate change, including the, the mitigation goal of reducing GHG pollution by um, protecting carbon sinks, the 30 by 30 initiative. This information can help maybe prioritize areas um, for protection for that initiative, as well as the America the Beautiful initiative that um, aims to connect and protect and restore America's lands and waters in order to combat climate change. Um, but also kind of drilling down to the role of MPAs, to me, I think the most compelling outcome of this is that we can really demonstrate the value of existing MPAs that have seafloor protections. I think oftentimes the blue carbon conversation really focuses on, you know, the, the photosynthesizing habitats that are taking up the carbon, which is super important, um, but when you think about the boundaries of our sanctuary and really all, all of our sanctuaries and, and many other MPAs, they often are, for the most part, protecting a lot of open ocean and deep sea environments. And so I think it's um, a really important point to make that those kind of offshore MPAs and sanctuaries um, play a really important role in kind of our national and global approach to climate mitigation by protecting those carbon stores and enabling those sequestration processes to continue to accumulate carbon on the seafloor. Um, clearly, you know, this information can and should be used to inform future MPA designations, to inform management decisions and in existing MPAs, and to inform marine spatial planning, including you know, siting and, and installation of offshore infrastructure. And we include this example from the UK because uh, they have done an incredible job of characterizing their seafloor and the carbon content of their seafloor. And they are actively using that information to inform MPA designation and marine spatial planning. Um, so really learning a lot from our colleagues um, in the UK and how this information could be used. Oh, just briefly, I'm gonna check the time. Okay, we're doing all right. Um, what is next? So Doug and I have a lot of great ideas of what we would like to see happen, and they kind of fall into two tracks, one focusing on kind of the data and, and technical needs, and then the other, the application of the information. So just briefly, um, kind of next steps for data needs. As, as Doug pointed out, we have a lot of geospatial data gaps, and so it would be great to be able to validate that model by increasing sampling effort in some of those areas better understanding if we can use um, like acoustic mapping to inform our substrate characterization versus um, substrate samples could also really help improve this work. And then moving forward and doing a more thorough impacts assessment. Um, that map of fishing effort that Doug shared, it's, it's so preliminary and limited. It's, it's only for nine years of data. It's based on vessel speed, so it's kind of implied that it's trawling data, and it's we don't have the data for the whole study area. Um, so being able to pull together, you know, the permits that we issue, all sorts of activities um, that could be disturbing the seafloor, and doing a more thorough impacts assessment is definitely a, a priority next step. And then as far as policy and management next steps, you know, I would love to see this information applied to how um, Greater Fairlands and Cordell Bank are managed through you know, permitting decisions, um, damage assessments for any sort of violation of regulations, um, siting of, of various you know, activities. And then um, as far as outside of sanctuaries, we're really prioritizing engaging with our state and federal partners that um, manage portions of the coastline and the sea floor to ensure that they're aware of this information and it could inform their activities as well. 
And then finally, we'd love to see a more widespread assessment of sediment carbon, both within sanctuaries, but also um, potentially in the United States exclusive economic zone to really provide kind of that baseline information to help inform decision making and um, C4 management. Briefly, we wanted to include this because, uh, you know, coming into this and wanting to do this study, we needed a lot of guidance. And thankfully, as I mentioned earlier, our colleagues in the UK are, are a bit ahead of us on this. And um, Dr. Craig Smeaton in particular provided a lot of great guidance. But when we are speaking to, um, you know, folks that represent MPAs, we want to make it clear that this is a pretty simple analysis. Um, I think the hardest step is getting your hands on the data and cleaning it and making sure it's ready uh, for analysis. But essentially, once you have grain size and organic carbon data, um, seeing if there's a relationship between those two parameters, applying that relationship to any records you may have that, that don't have organic carbon information but do have grain size, and then using that um, all of those records to build your geospatial model and then using that model to then calculate carbon stocks and kind of identify those carbon hotspots. Um, it's fairly straightforward and we would love to see more people do it. And certainly I, I, I'm sure I can speak for Doug when I say that we would love to you know, speak with any of you more about that if you, if you are interested. So in summary, this is the first analysis of seabed sediment carbon data for our area and certainly within the U.S. sanctuary system. We were really encouraged, as Doug mentioned, to find that the findings are generally consistent not only with other studies in other regions of the world, but also with this anecdotal and published knowledge that we have of our region in particular. And then the final point that I, I don't think could be belabored enough is that our sanctuary seafloor and really um, seafloor everywhere is a significant carbon store. And so protection of that carbon store is, is really critical. So with that, thank you everyone for your attendance and attention. And Doug and I are both happy to take questions. All right, thank you both Sarah and Doug. So yes, I would absolutely, we have a couple of questions that have come in, so I'll start answering those. But as a reminder, if you have any questions, please do drop them into the question box, which is on your control panel, often pops up on the right-hand side of your screen. So first question that has already been submitted, do these sediment maps change over time or are they pretty consistent? I love that question. Go Doug. Okay, can you hear me? I have a double mute situation. Mm -hmm. Yep, okay. <clears throat> um, that's a fantastic question and the answer is yes, but we don't know how much. Um, we have some accumulation rates for the region, large scale, but we don't have quantified accumulation rates um, or change rates, I should just say, uh, w within all these spots that we have data um, specifically. So we can apply some large thinking around the change, um, the change rates, but that would, that, that's one of our sort of, wow, it would be great to, to, to do some better coring, do some dating on the cores, and and really um, constrain how quickly things change and how how rapidly grain size might shift. In some places, like the mid, mid shelf mud belts, it probably doesn't change that much. But places that are more dynamic, say closer to uh, the Russian River, uh, as an example, or further offshore where there might be a turbidity currents or something, um, that might change. The grain size might shift a little bit more. It might be more dynamic. So. Constraining that, understanding that would help, um, would help, would, would do a better job of, of identifying that carbon changes. Thanks, another question notes that it is, is it asks, is it known that seafloor disturbance leads to significant remineralization or loss of sequestration, or might it simply result in the movement of carbon laden sediments to a new location? This could affect conclusions about the value or need for C4 protection. 
That's a great question. I'll start and then would love to hear from Doug too. Um, so I did a lot of research on this topic because clearly it can be a very contentious topic. And um, we, we wanted to take a very neutral and balanced approach in reviewing that literature in this report. And that is something that I'm, that I'm proud of is how we approached the potential impact of uh, disturbance and in particular fishing. And so, you know, there is mixed evidence in the literature, I will say that, as far as the eventual fate of the carbon that is disturbed. I think there is consensus that remineralization can and does occur. Um, and I think it depends on the, the intensity and frequency of disturbance. There are a lot of studies looking at that. But as far as kind of ecological implications, how it impacts the marine environment, if it makes any impact to atmospheric CO2 concentrations, those, I think, you know, the relationships there are a little um, more tenuous. But this area is super interesting to a lot of people. And so every month there's like another study that's come out. Just last month, there was another study that really attempted to quantify how long it takes for the remineralized, the the aqueous CO2 to make it up into surface waters to interact with the atmosphere. Um, so, I mean, I think within the next few years, we'll have a much better idea. The tricky thing is that it probably really varies depending on where you are in the world. Um, but I know Doug has mentioned a lot about the sediment plumes that are created and that stuff takes forever to settle back out. So Doug, I'm curious what you, what you think. Um, I, I, everything you've said is spot on, you know, I, I agree with, I mean, we're working together on this, so I'm, I'm learning as much from Sarah as, as she's drink, bringing into our sphere. Um, I, I would add to what you've said that the level of disturbance might have something to do with it too. Um, you know, if it's a major churning versus just kind of a drift, you know, like a, 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 a gentle, a gentle graze on the seafloor. Um, you know, how deep has that disturbance gone um, and, and dug into the seafloor? All of that would have something to do with just on a like on a micro scale, local level. But then, um, you know, ocean chemistry is something that is is also needs to be brought into this conversation um, for the re remineralization. As as you know, in our study area, we have a lot of upwell water. That water has as has a different pH and ox oxygen levels than other places in the world that might be muddy. That would have an impact potentially on how quickly that aqueous CO2 or aqueous carbon CO2 sort of moves around and settles back out or liberates up. So uh, like Sarah said, there's just a constant churning of information coming on this topic. And I think as more studies like this one and what the UK has done and places in the Gulf of Mexico, which hopefully will start coming online soon and looking at the same question. I think as we expand geographically around the world, these types of studies, the impetus to understand that, that, that whole arc from the seafloor all the way back up to the atmosphere or not is just going to continue to grow and we'll get more studies and more people working on it. So, um, yeah, stay tuned. I don't think we have an answer for it right now. Thanks. We have a pretty uh, straightforward methodological question. Someone wondering whether or not there's any particular significance to measuring the upper 10 centimeters of sediment for organic carbon. Do you want me to start with that one, Sarah? Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so, uh, yes, there is. Um, as you go down into the seafloor, um and you have different chemical reactions that are going on and there's a, p a point where the carbon uh the, the carbon that's being involved in those reactions uh it starts to decrease and um that i'm trying to trying to trying to like not get too bogged down in the details of this but essentially the upper levels of sediment it's the youngest it's the freshest usually. Um, it has not been packed down and those chemical reactions using up that carbon and stripping it out um, in, in the biology that's going on. So it's a much more active zone in the upper 10 centimeters. 
the deeper and deeper you go, um, those reactions start to slow down. Um, that interface with the, with the ocean water is lost. Um, you've lost the oxygen, oxygenated components of the water now, even though there's still poor water kind of dribbling through. Um, but so all of that together makes the upper 10 centimeters the, the target area to better understand and constrain ocean blue carbon. On land, well, in wetlands, in coastal wetlands, it's a much bigger depth that you can look at to better, to better understand what the carbon is doing. Um, so on land, we can go as deep as a meter or so um, and, and still get a better handle on what's going, or get, get a handle on what's going on in, that, um, in those processes. Uh, so it's just a, a, a lens that is the most active zone um, for these biochemical, biogeochemical reactions. Uh, Sarah, do you want to add more to that? But it's also it's also most relevant to management to look at the surficial sediments because that is really what we're concerned about. That's typically most disturbance, unless you're you know drilling down into the seabed to install an oil rig um, or a wind farm, maybe most disturbance that we're kind of concerned about is disturbing those surficial sediments. So there is a greater management relevance as well when we're estimating carbon for the surface. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, we have someone noting that they would expect seasonality to be important in terms of, sh of self sh shelf sediment loading. Uh, they're wondering if there's any plans to apply seasonal trends to your evaluation. I would have to do like with just accumulation rates, right, Doug? Yeah, yeah. I think accumulation rates. Um, it would. It, I'm, I'm thinking in my mind the way to do that. You know, doing a temporal study, just reoccupying a site over and over and over again, maybe over like a two or three year period, um, to just see if there is a seasonality before extending it out to a broader area. Um, certainly in the winter and spring when we have, our, you know, our atmospheric rivers and then big runoff um, is when our sediment plumes are, are, are pumping out into the, into the sanctuaries. Um, but there's also the biology side of this, you know, during upwelling when all the phytoplankton are blooming and then later when those blooms are dying, um, there's a seasonality there too. And that's out of sync from winter storms. So there might be a signal from terrestrial versus, um, say, marine, but they might actually just even each other out, um, you know, overall. So it's a good question to to add to a to, to how to, how to, how to do a, a next a next part of a of a survey. Um, but we have to quantify both sides of that: the terrestrial derived carbon as well as the marine derived carbon. That would be really cool to do. Isn't that through like carbon nitrogen ratios or something? You can mm -hmm. figure out if the carbon is of terrigenous origin yeah. or marine. Yeah, I would love to do that. Yeah, yeah, I'd love to. I'd love to do all kinds of things. You know, we could get out there and put yeah. put what's called sediment traps. These big funnels that would just collect collect right. the marine snow and and see how that changes through time. Um, that would help quantify that as well, the CN ratio. All right, I have, I have two questions that I'm gonna kind of throw into one because actually now it's three questions because a new one just came in on the same thing. So uh, people wondering how old the carbon, do you have an idea how old the carbon is and any accumulation rates or burial rates that show how old the top 10 centimeters and noting that that could counteract seasonality and the amount sequestered, but then people are also noting and wondering whether or not about how the top 10 centimeters being heavily disturbed by in fauna and remineralized re re by natural processes. So how do we consider both of those aspects, the age of the carbon in those top 10 centimeters, as well as the role of bioturbation and remineralization by natural biological processes? <laughs> All right, I'll go. I'll, 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 I see. I see Sarah staring at me again. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll do what I can with this one. It's a, it's a fantastic merging of concepts there. Um, 
So the accumulation rates can help us of the sediment, can help us estimate the age of the carbon. There's, uh, you know, carbon 14, carbon 15 dating. Um, and those ratios can also be identified. In fact, the study in 2022 that looked at one of the canyons, uh, the sediment in the canyon, looked at the ratios of delta 14, delta 15, um, to better understand the age of the carbon. So that these more advanced data are, you know, they're, they're rare in the data set that we have because it spans such a huge time frame. In 1960s, they weren't looking at that yet. Um, in the 2000s, when, oh, maybe that would be a thing to look at, maybe it was looked at, but it wasn't, a, you know, wasn't put in the databases. So there's patchiness of, of, that, of that data, but that analysis can certainly be done on new samples going forward. So um, the bioturbation question is, is really spot on because that's, a, it's, it's, that's part of the cycle, is like churning, you know, turning the carbon around and using it in different ways. Um, so while we think of the carbon gets down there, and you know, I really like Sarah's graphics earlier of, of, of the whale coming down and then the, you know, the, the skeleton and like it stays down there, it does. And it's, it's left, it's, it's used in activity on the seafloor. Um, however, I think what we are thinking about in terms of the management part is just like everything else that we're doing with the climate, the scale of what we are doing is so much faster and so much bigger than what nature may have been doing and, and has, has evolved to function at in balance that our disturbances might be so much bigger than the bioturbation um, in, its, in its larger impact. Um, even if bioturbation is covering more area, um, if that sort of, uh, you know, I'm, what's a good analogy for this would be, uh, you know, the evolution of, of trees to be in certain zones before, uh, you know, under certain conditions, they can move, trees can move, but the climate's changing faster than they can move. So the trees are going to be left behind. So that's the kind of thing I'm thinking about. Like we have a, we might be doing more damage quickly, potentially, um, faster and larger scale than what the bioturbation w has been doing for millennia. Um, yeah, Sarah, take it away. So, so I know Dr. Ruth Parker could answer this question. She has, yes. she's a biogeochemist. She presented with Doug and I at um, the UN Climate Talks. She's out of the UK with CFAS, which I think is Center for Fisheries and Aquatic Sciences, that might be wrong. Um, CFAS in the UK. But she's published on bioturbation and the impact on sediments and sediment carbon and the biogeochemistry. I thought I remembered her saying that bioturbation could actually enhance carbon burial, uh, but it's certainly not my area. And I, and I hope that's not egregiously incorrect. But Whoever asked that question, I would look into Dr. Ruth Parker's work because she has she's published on this. All right, we have a ton of questions that we haven't been able to get to. So I apologize to everyone who we weren't able to get to questions. There's a lot of interest. We will be giving the uh, setting the list of questions to the presenters. I do want to close with one last question. So we've been talking about blue carbon. The other major mitigation strategy that gets a lot of attention is marine carbon dioxide removal. And we've had a question that's popped up noting that a number of marine carbon dioxide removal strategies propose sinking giga to megaton amounts of biomass, mostly kelp or wood, in regions of the coastal ocean. So they note that criteria for site selection include things like sediment most likely to retain and preserve the biomass and ecosystems will be least harmed. They say that your analysis will, be, will likely be of great interest to the MCR community and they simply want to know what would you want that community to consider? Gosh, that's an that's an interesting question that you know Doug and I have presented this information dozens of times, and that hasn't quite come up. Uh, do you have any initial thoughts, Doug? I'll have to mull this over. Yeah, I, I think. I, I like the, the 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 criteria. I mean, admittedly, I have also not gotten too much into understanding all of the uh, marine carbon dioxide removal 
um, site criteria. Um, I think understanding the ocean chemistry locally and the seasonality of it is really important um, because you want to, we want to be putting it in places where not only is the seafloor not going to be disturbed, but if an unexpected disturbance occurs, that it won't be in an area that would enhance, uh, or maybe not enhance, but it would, you know, accelerate that remineralization again. Um, so I think considering the seafloor and what's right above the seafloor is really important. Um, that's my first, my first thought. I really appreciate the question. That's a great question. Sarah, what do you think? No, I mean, that's, I got nothing. I'm just interested to learn more potentially about how this type of work could inform that. That's interesting. All right, with that, we are actually a little bit over time. So I want to thank both of our presenters, Sarah Hutto and Dr. Doug George for their incredibly interesting uh, presentation and for their report. Right. Note that you can scan that QR code to get right to the report. If you look in the chat, I've also dropped a couple of links, including a link to a web page that has all three reports in this series. So I want to thank you all for your participation. Uh, once again, thanks to Sarah and Doug, and we hope to see you all at our next webinar. Thank you. Uh -huh.